Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 740. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 5th, 2022. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. George and I are recovering from July 4th festivities. Well, I am. I had people over to the RV, had a little picnic with pizza yesterday, had a lot of fun. Uh, George, what did you guys do for July 4th? I trimmed trees in the back of the yard of the house. How American of pie of you. Wow. Oh, trees. I got to play with the chainsaw and uh, a pole saw, all the fun things. That's uh, cool. So a lot of I, fun. I'm here in a campground in Wisconsin, and it seemed like the July 4 celebrations were muted compared to years past. Uh, I probably had the largest flag hanging out the, the front of the RV here. And um, reading from the polls and judging from people's faces, they're not as proud or willing to display their proudness for America as they were in the past. And you know, it was kind of, in my mind's eye, a sad July 4, George. Yes, there was. I saw a poll on one of the networks saying that only 38% of Americans polled mm -hmm. uh, were very proud uh, to be Americans or of the United States, mm -hmm. which is the lowest number they'd recorded since they started taking this poll. Now, one of the problems with polls is you don't know the questions that they asked <laughs> uh, to get to this answer. No, uh, polling, is, uh, polling is not a science by any means. Um, but if you if the question were are you proud of our country i think you would have had a different answer than are you proud of america with the connotation of the american government joe biden is at a level of unpopularity that is about the level that richard nixon was shortly before he resigned mm -hmm. and there's a sense i know of uh anger at uh, corruption uh, in the media, in the tops of the go heads of the government, um, just that the the government is run by people whose interests are not that of the country, but of their own pockets. And the I whole think Hunter Biden things and yeah, that's the big thing that's changed in the last you know dozen or so years is nobody is looking out for the Amer the American. Uh, certainly, journalism is dead. You know, the, once a, a proud part of uh, and a proud feature of what it was to be an American was to have a free press. And the press is, is completely lost in all this. All they do is uh, show a very political bias in all those stories. And it's very difficult to watch the news or to read the news and find out what stories are made up and what stories are true and what stories um, are going to be influ influential in what I think about America. And in the same respect, We've been, at least since the Biden administration, teaching our children in public schools to hate America and to worry about climate change and to be, uh, you know, social justice warriors and not to be American citizens. Yeah, and you're seeing the consequence. I think it goes back to Obama, the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a brief interlude under Donald Trump, but Donald Trump doesn't just control school curriculum. No. Uh, local school boards do and there's been a concerted effort across the united states for by liberal activists to capture the control of school boards you see this most notably in places like suburban washington and new york and chicago not down here in hooterville we don't have those problems no but uh the whole uh gender issues and sexuality issues and uh the whole 1619 project blaming america and all this and that which of course is all nonsense and lies, uh, but we see it in the church. We see, uh, uh, you know, in the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry pushing the, uh, the Episcopal Church is doing this big campaign on ra racial reconciliation, and they are laying out the, the groundworks and they're basing it on critical race theory. So you know exactly what road they're going down. And then you have bishops, uh, my bishop here in central florida for instance there was a uh, a bomb threat at a historically black college uh over in daytona beach bethune cookman college and the bishop uh, put out a sent out an email for we should pray for this 
Now, the bishop doesn't send out any sort of email when we have any other uh, issue, but only these things, and it turned out to be a hoax, mm -hmm. as so many of these, uh, you know, anti-Muslim events, uh, racist attacks, you know, the Jesse, Jesse Smollett stuff. And our elites, even, in, even, in, even down here in Florida, are buying into it. The city of Orlando put out a tweet apologizing uh, for the 4th of July, uh, saying, I know some people that we know some people don't want to celebrate this country on this day. Now, they had to back down after popular. But where are these people coming from? What is driving this idiocy? Now, I know uh, mediocre and uh, silly people will follow the fashions of the moment. Mm -hmm. There's somebody driving this. Who is it? What are they doing this for? Well, I think certainly the press is driving it. I think certainly the left is driving it. Uh, critical race theory is uh, abundant in all this. But a nation that teaches its children to hate the nation will mm -hmm. will not succeed past the next generation. Mm -hmm. You know, th these kids are coming home from school uh, after taking reading classes with the drag queens, with... Uh, um, you know, seeing Al Gore's film every other week, it it's just hard to watch knowing that this is not the way I was raised. I was raised uh, in public schools to be a uh, person who loves the sciences, who lo wants to be an American citizen, and who is going to school to further my life beyond school to eventually have a career. <laughs> And we're seeing the effects of the education system immediately in military recruitment. Mm -hmm. The Army and Navy and the Marines and the Air Force have all put out statements saying they're going to fall far, far short of their recruitment goals. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that uh, young people have been taught anti-patriotism, and patriotism was almost, was a major component in having young people sign up for the military. Sure. Or, the, or so, to be a police officer or a fireman. Those were the heroes uh, of our youth. And with the Navy more concerned about, you know, proper usage of pronouns uh, than it is in combating China and Russia, we've got a major problem. We've got woke officers at the top, uh, careerists, uh, people who will just slavishly follow the... Uh, uh, well, you know, we had uh, Liz Cheney, the Republican Congresswoman from Wyoming, who is uh, famous for her dislike of Donald Trump, saying that the greatest threat facing this country, it's not inflation, it's not China, it's not Russia, it's not the climate. It's the greatest threat, threat facing this country, she says, is Donald Trump. Now, this is demented. This is actually getting demented in the mindset where you have a member of our Congress, a member of our government, someone of consequence, saying the greatest problem is a former president rather than the actual problems before us. Um, mm. it, it, we're in a bad spot in the United States. We're in a tough spot, yeah, and I agree. And we'll have to see what happens as we change in, into the future. Uh, I don't think Joe Biden will be reelected, uh, clearly. Uh, you could run anybody, Democrat or Republican, against him, um, and he will win. I don't think uh, Camilla Harris would uh, be able to attain the highest office either. So we'll just see how this plays out in the next two or three, four years. You know, it's crazy to watch from the ground. Um, let's... But, but the, the, the former bastions of sanity... Mm -hmm. uh, maybe two or three generations ago, the academia, the church, the military, uh, the press, the things that kept sort of the, you know, the focus and mind of the country centered on on the fight. They've all gone over to the other side. Yeah. And that's frightening, I think. It's frightening because we've lost a generation. Uh, we're, we're now a nation full of mass shooters, so to speak. And when you look at what's happening uh, through the lens of, the, of journalism, they're telling us it's just these right ran, <laughs> right ran, uh, right branded uh, mm -hmm. young American kids who follow Trump who are becoming shooters. When in reality, these are kids from broken families. 
Uh, Kevin, you raised this point, I think, two or three episodes ago mm -hmm. about Daniel Patrick Moynihan's uh, sure. study in the late 1960s, and it was entitled The Negro Family. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't say that today, but that's what the title in the late 60s the title, was. Yeah. And the issue was that the lack of fathers in homes is causing the uh, destruction of society in this particular group. And this fatherlessness is, is actually spreading across all sectors and uh, demographic groups. And even uh, what the difference nowadays between the rich and the poor is the rich will have, rich children usually have two parents and the poor have one. And that absence of, what links all these shooters of the past few weeks isn't membership in the NRA. It, they're not gun nuts. What links them all is that they didn't have, they came out of broken homes. Yeah, broken they had family. dysfunctional family. Even yeah. this, even this creep uh, at the Highland Park shootings yesterday. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you were telling me that he didn't have a, I mean, what was... Oh, he lived guy? with his father. He, he, it was a broken home and uh, he lived in the apartment behind his house. And you, you read all the stories, he was, a, he was a lonely, quiet boy. That's, that's the headline going around. And that produces in america mass shooters Yeah, you know, we found that in florida we find that in texas we find that all over our nation is they're not members of the nra they're not members of some right-wing uh political brand they come from broken families and that's the number one problem we as a nation have to uh track down and fix how do we stop having broken families when the left doesn't even believe in marriage you know half this country has lost faith in marriage Half this country has lost, and more than that, has lost uh, faith in what a family is. And to them, a, a family is just people you partner with. And if For the time being. For the time being. It, it, partners of convenience. And so if we're just going to have partners of convenience be our families, we're going to produce more mass shooters, more people uh, uh, having drug habits and uh, you know meth heads. Uh, it, the destruction of our society will fall when the family falls. And this is my bone of contention with people like Justin Welby or Michael Curry or bishops against gun violence in the Episcopal Church. Hmm. They, they're they attacking and addressing the wrong target. The wrong target isn't guns. The right wrong, the, the target is a lack of Christian formation of faith, a lack of family. In other words, you start along this chain, no faith, no family, uh, dysfunctional children, video games, guns, massacre. And they're picking targets to pr protest far down the chain of actions rather than address the true issue, which is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and converting the nation. They don't want to convert the nation. They want to talk about gun violence. Now, I'm against gun violence. But if you don't start where you can, if you don't start where you can change things, you're going to continue to have gun violence and you're going to continue to be ineffective, wishy-washy drones that accomplish nothing other than take 10% of my parish income. Uh. Yeah, preset. We haven't done any Anglican stories yet. Let's let's move on. So th that's our J July 4th commentary. Um, we'll see how this plays out. Church of Nigeria news, George. Uh, the Church of Nigeria has decided to uh, uh, form more churches over here in Acna country. And we've talked about this before. Uh, we remember, you know, quite vividly the promises of Peter Akaganola and others that uh, when setting up the ACNA and helping set up a new province here in America, they would uh, consecrate uh, American bishops to be Nigerian bishops and then they would when there's finally a good province here they would turn over control to that province well we have a good healthy uh, province here it's existed for more than 10 years it's run by Archbishop Foley yet the Nigerians continue to what I'll call and it's been called this for uh, centuries border cross and let's let's talk about this George Anglican Diocese the Trinity which is part of the Church of Nigeria's uh, structures in the United States uh, 
open two new churches, had them consecrated this past week. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry Ndukaba, the primate of Nigeria, came over and uh, consecrated a church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Newark, New Jersey. Now, I'm of mixed mind on this. It's wonderful that they're new churches. It's Absolutely. wonderful that people are serving uh, new communities. These congregations look to be Nigerian expatriates living in the United States. It's wonderful. It's great that they are reaching out and building faith communities. That's a positive. The negative is I don't see how this advances Anglicanism or the faith in general because the, the, the arguments have been, well, the church ACNA is not as pure as the Church of Nigeria. Now, that's that's a debatable topic, especially when we start looking at some of the Church of Nigeria's bishops on the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. But to say, to go into this, we're purer than you are, is uh, not an argument I think the ACNA and Church of Nigeria should have. Mm -hmm. And second, I'm really not in agreement with the idea of ethnic churches. This is the problem that develops the Orthodox in the United States. We have right. the yep. Greeks, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, the this and that. And for a generation or two, they've been trying to form an Orthodox Church of America, but the ethnic churches are happier, more hap want to be Greek rather than Orthodox. They're pressing nationality over faith. And I think this is a danger with, with these sorts of moves from overseas Anglicans coming in who really don't have a quarrel with the theology, but rather just keep it among people like us. Yeah, and if you're looking long term at this politically, Nigeria's a, a, a part of GAFCON, this makes GAFCON look bad too. You know, if mm -hmm. GAFCON can't control border crossing and can't uh, have provinces that support each other and provinces who want to mutually encourage each other to grow, um, without crossing the border, what's the point of having GAFCON? You know, and uh, it makes GAFCON look bad. And so we're saying to Lambeth and we're t saying to the Church of England, you know, GAFCON's a great alternative to the structures of the Anglican Communion. Why don't you come join us? Well, but we still border cross. You know, we still think some provinces are better than other provinces within GAFCON. And long term, when I was in seminary in like, New Haven, Connecticut, Susan and I lived in a little apartment, and we lived on a square. And on this square, there were three Catholic churches, one L Lithuanian, mm -hmm. one uh, Polish, and one Italian. And they were built about 50, 60 years ago because the Italians wouldn't go to a Lithuanian church and the Poles wouldn't go to an Italian church, so they had to have the three churches. Well, the problem right that they have right now is that basically they've had to close two of the three, amalgamate them all because people don't identify as Lithuanian uh, anymore. They're Americans yep. as generations pass. They move out of the neighborhood, so on and so forth. Now, that's a small microcosm of, uh, of issue of the issue. But, you know, and eventually Nigerians will be fully enculturated into America and they really won't want to have uh an ethnic church that we want a part of a wider christian church and i think just think it's a short term i think it's a short term way forward that is not going to be successful in the long term yeah i do agree with you uh, ethnic churches seem to be a generation and a half from closing we see that all over new england um let's move on to the south indian moderator is accused of uh, under criminal charges of being corrupt and we've covered his story before but we need to cover it now because he's been invited to lambeth and the people who are accusing him of corruption are afraid that he will not come back to india uh if he gets to go uh, with a passport to lambeth so here's our indian yes corruption this is story. a fun i'm so happy kevin's <laughs> finally allowed me to do an indian corruption story and the reason why is it has a lambeth hook the moderator of the Church of South India, the bishop in South Kerala, has been fighting 13 criminal charges. Uh, we've reported on Anglican Inc. extensively about his problems, Bishop Rasalam. Uh, he had the, the diocese, his diocese owns a medical school, and he was selling admissions to the medical school, not cheap. The money. Not cheap. Not cheap. 
Yeah. The doctor in India is a way out of the country if you want to move to the United States. Yeah. Uh, you need a medical degree. Uh, and most recently, in March of this year, the CIB, the Criminal Investigation Bureau, which is the Indian FBI, if you will, has initiated an investigation into the bishop for working with some corrupt bank officials to mortgage church properties and then pocket the mortgage proceeds. Not go through the uh, standing committees or anything like that, but just basically you know, defraud the bank and defraud yeah. the church and keep the money. Well, the bishop is going to Lambeth, and anti-corruption activists have asked the Indian government to seize his passport, saying, this guy's not going to come back. The temperature of the water is getting hotter and hotter and hotter in, in India, and once this guy's gone, he's gone. And this is not an unusual thing. When we had that, uh, remember the tsunami that hit South India? Mm -hmm. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, the uh, general secretary, the, a lay leader, a woman of the Church of South India, pocketed over three quarters of the money sent by America, Trinity Wall Street, diocesan funds, they stole it. And then she's, once the police found out, she's disappeared. Absolutely. She's never been seen again. Yep. So uh, we're not talking about fantastical stuff. Uh, there are bishops who've been jailed for theft, and at one time over half of the bishops were under active criminal investigation. Um, Indian church is in real... Indian church is kept alive by the faith of the people, and they're just infected with a corrupt clergy system. What? And Now, in fairness to the... we call this a church problem, it's actually a national problem. You know, corruption yeah. is just built into the ethos of India and, and some other countries where, you know, to get ahead, you have to do some things that the Westerners would think you wouldn't want to do because it's, it, it shows hypocrisy, corruption, and it's, it's certainly a crime here in America where it's not so much a crime there, it's an opportunity. Yeah, in India, in the Church of South India, it's not uncommon to buy Episcopal office. Mm -hmm. You basically, if there's an election, the guy spread the most money around, gets the job, and he recoups that money by diverting diocesan funds to sort of repay or bless with uh, cash jobs uh, those who supported him. It's not just India. Uh, Tanzania has a major problem with corruption, and other African churches have a major problem with corruption. Um, Mexico for years when it was under it was known as the dirtiest church in the Anglican world it's been cleaned up uh, after some major struggles but uh, you know this is the thing that uh, sort of gets me when the bishops go to Lambeth I know they mean well but they really I think would be better suited to talk about corruption within their own ranks than climate change because they can do something about corruption, they can't do anything about climate change. Well, they can do something here because you can uninvite this bishop to uh, Lambeth and uh, allow the investigation of his crimes to continue so he can't flee with the money that he already has offshore. So, Well, at the press conference they gave for the Lambeth conference mm -hmm. week before last, uh, I asked that question, not about this man in particular, sure. but... The answer from the Lambeth Conference people was, so long as a bishop is in good standing within his province, we're not going to say no. So when the moderator's a crook, uh, he's the one that says, oh, yes, I'm in good standing. Good standing? So good standing? Go. Yeah, it's me. I'm good standing. Well, All right, well, actually, hey. they're, not, they're not totally blind. They're not totally blind. Do you remember no. the uh, Lambeth uh, primates meeting, uh, the, uh, that last one where they were all there? Okay, the, that, not the gathering from five, six years ago. The the meeting that was just like two years ago, last year? The one that was not a primates meeting, but was a primates meeting. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where uh, you were there. Okay, the um, gathering, yes, primates gathering. Yeah, and they appointed the primate of South India to be on this follow-up committee. And then it was sort of pointed out by mean-spirited press people like Anglican Inc., that this guy was under active criminal investigation for corruption and fraud, and he was quietly dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, no reason was given for dropping. So they do know. 
Okay. But they're only going to act if it's sort of the mirror is held up to their face. Well, this would help India. We're not trying to help uh, the Church of England or the Anglican Communion, but you could certainly help with the criminal investigation. Uh, Church of England is in the news. Moody says they're worthy. Double A one bond rating. Man. <laughs> the church commissioners who manage ten billion in assets for the first time are going to the capital markets to raise money. And Moody's has given them a higher credit rating than the British sovereign debt. So this is a safe harbor. Uh, and they're going to use the money to uh, do do good or projects, uh, making uh, churches and you know carbon neutral, uh, rectories carbon neutral, uh, rate, basically, if I were a clergyman of the Church of England, I'd be furious. They're not going to do anything about they're, the they're underpaid. They're not going to do anything about the problems with the pensions and the underpayments mm. and just how hard it is to live on the clergy stipend. They're not going to do anything about the diocese sucking up all the money out of the parishes to support a bloated bureaucracy. Rather, they're going to borrow more money. The church commissioners are going to borrow more money and use it to fund like these boondoggles, like 20 million pounds for a race and reconciliation commission, whatever its name is. I don't know its name. Uh, now, this money has to be repaid. And at the end of the day, this comes out of money that was originally set aside to support the mission and work of the church. And, well, I don't get to decide what the mission work of the church is, but these, you know, women's officers, diversity officer, climate officer, ecumenical officer, having more people with uh, offices getting paid than actual people who share the good news of Jesus Christ, I think that's a bad use of funds. Don't they have a new right. office called anybody but calvin robinson commission office something yes yes yeah, that's, that's that's uh oh uh, one of our one of our friends one of our viewers uh the uh bishop of edmonton as an aside uh gave a sermon on sunday and talked about how horrible cancel culture was and our friend wrote well this is exactly the man who led the cancel culture against calvin robinson these people have no self-awareness no they don't no self-awareness they don't it's true well in fact we talked about this before um you and i've been probably the first major critics of mutual flourishing where we talk about it's a failed system it didn't work it ran the conservatives and the anglo anglo catholics out of the church of england it, it decimated well, that ministry and well, we, we should clarify because we're probably the first major critics who have a website and a video. Okay, yes. People have been, we have, the first people journalist. have been complaining yes. about this. <laughs> okay. we're, we're the first people who do what we do. Yes. To, to, up to, to bring, we've just, it's been an utter failure. It's destroyed the church. It's destroyed the culture within the church. And conservatives have been run out and have been taken out of any, have been left out of leadership. And now they're they've putting together a commission to study mutual flourishing. And these blind people, I assure you, will say mutual flourishing has been a blessing to the Church of England. George. Oh, they've set up a 12-person 12, uh, 12 committee uh -huh. to basically look at whether mutual flourishing has worked. There are two bishops leading it, Helen Ann Hartley uh, and the Bishop of Fulham. And Helen Ann Hartley is a younger woman bishop who's very confident, very capable, very bright. And the Bishop of Fulham is one of the weakest, most ineffective conservatives out there. So basically how you set up a committee, we know the outcome that's going to be right now. They're going to, the Bishop of Fulham will say catty things but and make a point or two uh, in favor of uh, the fa fact that mutual flourishing isn't working, but at the end of the day, he will go along because he gets along. And you'll have this report saying everything's just wonderful. It's just a few sour apples, uh, sour people, few bad apples expressing sour grapes or whatever the phrases sure. are. Well, a perfect example, they just put out a report about the priest who committed suicide in the Church of England after he was railroaded after some rumors 
uh, that he had uh, sexual contact with somebody. And Alan, Griff Alan Griffin yeah. was a retired priest of the Diocese of London. Mm -hmm. He later entered the Catholic Church, uh, Anglo-Catholic, and somebody said in the uh, official offices of the Diocese of London, well, you know, we think he might be... Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, no and that started into, he's a child molester. No evidence, no complaints. But it got into the official mind, and he essentially had to live through years of innuendo and pseudo-investigations and this and that, and he finally took his own life out of in depression. Well, they commissioned a Lessons Learned review, and that was published this morning. Uh, Bishop Mullally of London sent it out to the clergy, and we were sent a copy. And I'm looking at the cover sheet for this re Lessons Learned review, and it's appalling because the cover sheet spends basically as much time saying how wonderful Bishop Sarah Mullally is. She's leading the fight to make sure this doesn't happen again. Well, who was in charge? Where did the buck stop? You know, she was the bishop over Bishop, uh, over Father Griffin. She was the bishop whose staff did all this. And the, and the cover sheet spends the time saying she's doing a wonderful job. Her hands are clean. Her hands are clean. It, when my children were little, uh, we had twin girls, have twin girls, and something bad was done. I would say, who did this? And they would say, we didn't do it. I said, I guess it was little nobody who did this. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Church of England, little nobody destroyed the life of Father Alan Griffin. Nobody else did. Yeah. Uh, as long as we're, let's finish up with the Church of England. They're redoing their flying bishops. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is... Uh, I had to learn a new language when I moved to England 20-odd years ago. Mm -hmm. I had to learn English English. Um, and I had to learn to read and understand and pick up new ones. Well, a formal announcement was made uh, by the Church of England Media Center saying that we're going to be reshuffling the flying bishops. There are four flying bishops, one based in London, the Bishop of Fulham, who remains in London. There's an evangelical flying bishop, Rod Thomas, who's based in Maidstone, which is in the Diocese of Canterbury. Rod retires this fall. There's the Bishop of Ebbsfleet, who uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, I just forgot his last name. He left to become a Roman Catholic. That seat is vacant. And there's one up in the province of York. They're going to reorganize the three that are in the province of Canterbury. And what they're going to do is they're going to create a new see, Oswestry, in the Diocese of Lichfield. And they're going to shuffle people. The new evangelical flying bishop will be moved to Ebbsfleet. The new Ebbsfleet flying bishop will be moved to Oswestry, up into the middle of England. And then the last line, so to speak, was, well, and if Maidstone needs to revert to Canterbury as a suffragan, that's an opportunity for it. Well, the talk among the, the well, the society under the patronage of St. Uh, Wilfrid and St. Hilda, and that's not, SWISH is the acronym, and that's really an unfortunate acronym for an Anglo-Catholic, but that's a mean thing to say, SWISH. Uh, some people will get that, others won't. Uh, Swish put out a statement saying, oh, how wonderful, line one. Of course, this doesn't change anything, line two. And line three, this is massively inconvenient yes, because is. you're now, basically, there's no coverage in Southwest yeah. England by basically taking away Ebb's fleet and moving them up to the middle of England. Mm -hmm. It's four to five hours to get down to some of these parishes. What do you people think you're doing? Well, what they're doing is freeing up Maidstone because Rose Hudson Wilkes, the Bishop of Dover, who actually runs the Diocese of Canterbury on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury, has proven to be an utter fiasco. And the Archbishop of Canterbury needs another bishop to actually do the work of the bishop he hired as a virtue signaling appointment, first black female bishop in England. He actually needs somebody to actually do the job. Somebody has to do the job now, yes. So, you know, bishop, uh, but it's all being cloaked in efficiency and this and that. And 
really what it is, is bailing out the Archbishop of Canterbury once again for a god-awful appointment. All right, our next story. Uh, the Episcopal Church has been investigating another change in doctrine. They want to have communion without baptism uh, as part of a test liturgy. Oh boy, uh, it brought up a lot of talk. And to my surprise, uh, theologians in the Episcopal Church said, no, we're not going that way. That's a bridge too far. And I'm like, that's a bridge too far? <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what's happening here at the, the level where this would not be proposed at General Convention, George. I, Diocese of Northern California put forward a resolution, and this has come in the past from other Northwestern U.S. dioceses, mm -hmm. uh, asking that uh, communion be open to anyone, including those who've not been baptized. The current rule is that if you're baptized as a Christian uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water, you may receive communion if it is the custom to receive communion in your own church. Uh, they wanted to get rid of that. Part of it was, and it was to be a sign of welcome, full inclusion of people who've wandered into the church or maybe visiting, that they can be part of this ritual. Well, this has been defeated in the past, and this was proposed again, and they basically all the theology professors of the Episcopal churches put together a joint statements saying, no, this is not what Eucharist is. And the bishops said, no, this is not what we want. And we had some excellent essays from theologians and writers on Anglican Inc. saying mm -hmm. this is absolute nonsense. They don't understand what they're talking about. Well, the Standing Committee on Literature and Mu on Liturgy and Music, which basically organizes these sorts of resolutions, quietly kicked this one into the tall grass and they're not going to consider it. So the grown-ups are going uh, we're in charge now we are going to see some wokery uh william portia dubois dubose who is a former one of the one of the heroes of swanee he's in a calendar uh, the episcopal church calendar he's going to be dropped the first time we're dropping anybody the reason why he was a confederate he was and, not Yes, he was. <laughs> and his family owned slaves. He didn't, but his family did. And therefore... Guilty by association. Uh, guilty by association. And, uh, you know, he cancel culture. Mm -hmm. It's going to take out William Portia DuBose. Yeah. Somebody had to go. It was going to be him for sure. Let's uh, talk. Oh, we got here. Oh, and there was one bit of good news. Okay. There was a push to have Barbara Harris, the first black woman bishop of the Episcopal Church, added to the calendar. Now, the rule is that you have to wait 50 years after you're dead. Okay. It's only been waived for Martin Luther King Jr., right. which I can agree with, yeah, and okay. Oscar Romero, the martyred archbishop in okay. El Salvador. Everybody else has to wait 50 years after their death. And it was argued that Barbara Harris is on that level. Now, I knew Barbara Harris. She was a very, un she was like Rose Hudson Wilkes. She, she was knew lots of words that started with limited to four letters, yes. Yes. <laughs> she was a character and not a Christian character, And but her backers thought she was. But And, and actually, I think part of the deal was we'll kick out the Confederates so long as we don't have to add Barbara Harris for 50 years. So. We'll the be deal, Kevin, you and I'll be dead by then, so we don't need to worry. Don't about have to worry it. about it. Um, I want to talk to you. You know, there's a couple Roman Catholic uh, stories going around. One is the Pope's going to retire, so we'd have two retired popes uh, hanging out over there in Rome. Also, I've seen Nancy Pelosi and her husband receiving communion over in the Vatican last week, and this brings up that whole discussion we we had about you know just recently communion with the Episcopal Church community within the Roman Catholic Church, where she was denied by her archbishop, uh, but now received by the Vatican. Ouch. Archbishop Coeur de Leon, Archbishop of San Francisco, Catholic, has, as a matter of, says he could not live with his conscience if he permitted her to receive communion because of her stand on abortion. Correct. Gregory Wilton, the Archbishop of Washington, says, well, we're not going to look at this. We're just going to close our eyes. Uh, in the Vatican, Nancy Pelosi and her husband uh, were received. And 
they were she had received communion at the Vatican. Now, this was not the Pope's doing. These are sort of the drones, the people in the Vatican establishment who so, are deliberately poking Archbishop Coeur d'Alene in the eye by basically allowing Nancy Pelosi to receive communion when she shouldn't, according to the rules of the Catholic Church. How does one have an audience with the Pope? You know somebody who knows somebody. Okay, so you, I can't just call over to the back and say, my name is Kevin, the Pope would probably love to meet with me, I'm going to be in the area. It's, it's a little bit more convoluted than that. Well, Ann Coulter, the columnist who's very acerbic and sharp tongue, mm -hmm. talked about this recent tweet of Elon Musk and the Pope. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk and four of his seven children visited and were received by the Pope. And uh, Ann Coulter said that, you know, one of the wealthiest men with the most influence and power in the world that has been uh, met with Elon Musk. Uh, <laughs> uh, she had a nice dig at Francis. There, yeah. but, uh, but basically, Kevin, you and I are not going to have, uh, unless we're part of a group or it, it's who you know. It, it, well, hold on, hold on. I know Archbishop Greg Venables friend of the pope maybe we could get something going there you know we'd call up and have a an audience with the pope but they would insist i wear my suit which is still in the closet somewhere in storage so we'd have to we'd have to work all that out uh i think that's all of our stories we got one left here we, we we've got the women deacons story oh yes okay so in the acna we have uh women's orders uh where you can be a priest a deacon or a deaconess and I think to really uh, candle the Bangladesh Jerusalem story, we need to talk about the difference between deacons and deaconesses. We'll start there. A deacon, it can be a male or man or a woman, mm -hmm. and it is an order of ministry. They're ordained. Um, a deaconess is commissioned, and that is not an ordained post, and it was revived in the 1880s in the Church of England, in the 1870s, I think, in the Episcopal Church. And it is continues in the Reformed Episcopal Church, deaconesses, and the Diocese of Sydney, I'm not sure, and in the Lutheran, some Lutheran churches have deaconesses. Uh, the Diocese of Jerusalem at their recent synod meeting in Amman, Jordan, uh, approved resolution studying the vocational diaconate, allowing men and women to become deacons. But then the bishop said, these people, the, the women would not be ordained, they'd be commissioned. So what he's saying is that, now this was received with great joy from the Episcopal Church because Episcopal Church backs women's orders, mm -hmm. and it puts a lot of money into the Diocese of Jerusalem and has been pushing the Diocese of Jerusalem to open the ministry to women. But what the Archbishop has done, without saying it directly, is yes, we'll have women deacons, but they'll be deaconesses, the commission. not deacons, yeah, yeah. because they're not going to be ordained, they're going to be commissioned. While we will have male vocational deacons, like we have in the Episcopal Church and the Catholic Church, who will be ordained. Um, so that's happening in Jerusalem. And in Bangladesh, just out of out as, a, as an aside, after a 15-year hiatus, they've just ordained two new deacons. Ordained, not commissioned. And in Bangladesh, the canons permit women clergy, but it's really up to the archbishop whether or not he wants it, the moderator of the Church of Bangladesh. And there's a new moderator, new new team at the top, and he said, yeah, why not? We need women to do the work of women's ministry, and we're, we want women... Uh, we we need these women to do women's work as deacons. So there's movement that these minutiae I think are fascinating to me. <laughs> Nobody are. else, probably. No, that's what we're saving away for the end of the show. I'm about to have a cat jump on the laptop here because a fly landed on the laptop, and all flies must be destroyed by Rye the cat, the killer cat. So we're trying off here. Keep, keep the cat. Brush away the fly. Are you get? Are you giving the cat enough protein in its diet, Kevin? I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm trying to restore order to the, the, the studio here before we do that. Yeah, they, we have two cats. We have Whiskey, who plays with insects that make it in the front door. 
And then we have Rye, who only eats the insects that come inside the door. So, you know, Rye or Whiskey's just playing around, bad the little poor little fly, and all of a sudden, whoomp, Whiskey goes, mine. <laughs> it's, ooh, oh, ah, we don't have flies in our RV. That's, that's how it works. All right, that's all the stories we have for this week. Um, kind of a short episode, gives you time to recover from your July 4th activities. Uh, for those of you still under the monarchy, long live the queen. And th yeah, that prayer is really working well over there. You know, the queen's still going strong, and we're very proud of her. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 740 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>